Hello, it's Scott Manley here. For many, October 4th, 1957 marks the beginning of the Space Age, because on that day, Sputnik 1 was launched on board a Soviet rocket. That particular rocket was an R-7 rocket designed by Sergei Korolev, and that rocket would actually go on to have a long and illustrious career, so I figured it would be a good time to talk about the R-7 rocket and how it became the Sputnik launcher, and how it ultimately became the launcher of Soyuz and still supplies the International Space Station to this day. The development of the R-7 began in 1953, led by Sergei Korolev. It was originally designed to be an intercontinental ballistic missile intended to carry a 3,000 kilogram payload over 8,000 kilometers, enabling the Soviet Union to strike at the USA. It used a two-stage design with four boosters and one core, with all the engines being lit at launch. Fully fueled, it would be 280 metric tons, 34 meters high, that would be 112 feet. At the time, this would be the largest rocket in the world, and to push something this big into the air required some serious engines. Now, the R7 used four booster engines and a single core engine. They all burned liquid oxygen and uh, kerosene. The turbo pumps were actually powered by the decomposition of peroxide. The engines were designed by Valentin Glushko, who would later go on to run the whole Soviet space program. The, the engines themselves, they used four combustion chambers fed by a single turbo pump. Now, the four booster engines were called RD-107s, and each of them came with two steerable vernier thrusters for control. The core engine was an RD-108, essentially the same, but it came with four vernier thrusters instead. The RD-107 really was a miracle of technology for its era. It was one of the first engines with active mixture control, which was really important because the boosters all had to balance their uh, thrust and fuel consumption during the launch. They would, of course, light all five engines on the ground, and then about 100 seconds into flight, the four exterior boosters would peel off in a cross-like formation referred to as the Korolev Cross. Meanwhile, the core booster would continue burning, carrying the payload further along on its journey. Launch testing began in 1957 at what would ultimately become the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The first launch on May 15th failed due to a fire in the tail section, which triggered engine shutdown after 98 seconds. It still delivered the test payload a whole 3,000 kilometers downrange. The first successful flight would be on August 21st, 1957. However, the payload disintegrated on re-entry. It had proven itself as a rocket, but not as a weapon. But that was enough to uh, get Korolev his chance to actually launch a satellite. The R-7 had a designed range of 8,000 kilometers. To actually make it work as an orbital launcher required stripping it way down. There was no need for the warhead or guidance hardware, and stripping that out brought the launch mass down to about 267 tons. The scientists had designed a spacecraft stuffed with scientific instruments. It was known cryptically as Object D, but delays and concerns over its rising mass led to it being replaced by a much simpler design, the Prostyeshi Sputnik 1, meaning simple satellite. Sputnik 1 launched on uh, October 4th, 1957, and it ultimately carried the satellite into a 215 by 913 kilometer orbit, along with the core booster stage. It's worth noting that many people who claim to have seen Sputnik in orbit actually saw the much larger and brighter booster. Sputnik 1 also came very close to failing. The Block G booster engine did not reach full power before liftoff, and for the first few seconds the guidance system had to work hard to compensate for this, almost reaching the limit before the engine stabilised. The rocket also suffered a failure in the fuel regulation system that resulted in higher consumption of kerosene than intended, and the result was an unintended shutdown of the core stage about a second earlier than expected, but by that point the spacecraft was in orbit. A month later, Sputnik 2 would use an identical design to launch Laika into space. Laika was the first living space traveller who unfortunately would die hours after launch due to a failure in the temperature regulation system. 
Small improvements to the engines enabled Sputnik 3 to carry a much heavier payload, and so Object D was finally launched as the next payload. But the first launch attempt resulted in the loss of the rocket and the satellite. A new spacecraft and launch vehicle would take Sputnik 3 to orbit in May of 1958. The next significant iteration of the R-7 added a third stage powered by an RD-105, which was itself based off the Vernier thrusters on the RD-107s. This design launched a total of nine times, however six of those were failures, but that does mean that three of them were successes and they all achieved important firsts. Luna 1 was supposed to hit the moon, but instead it missed and became the first artificial object to reach escape velocity. Luna 2 was the first probe to impact the moon, and Luna 3 was the first spacecraft to photograph the far side of the moon. In 1960, the first Vostok test launches began. The tank on the upper stage was stretched, enabling payloads of 4.5 tonnes to be delivered to orbit, and later the RD-105 engine was replaced with an improved RD-109 engine, which ultimately powered Yuri Gagarin into orbit in 1961. While the Vostok spacecraft was only used for a small number of crewed launches, the Vostok 2 and Vostok 2M rockets were evolved versions which launched satellites all the way up till 1991. The Vostok spacecraft itself was also the basis to the Zenit reconnaissance satellites, and over 500 of those were flown right up until 1994. A Zenit payload would be the first spacecraft launched from Placet's Cosmodrome in 1966. Alongside the Vostok development, a crash program rushed to make an R-7 capable of launching interplanetary missions, known as the Molnia. This used a third stage powered by a derivative of the RD-108 used in the core, and a fourth stage powered by an S-15400, which had the ability to restart in flight. However, the early versions of Molnia were unreliable, with only two successful launches out of a dozen attempts. Venera 1 headed to Venus, and Mars 1 headed to Mars, obviously. Both would be the first of their kind, and both would fail in flight before reaching their destination. Despite this rocky start, Molnia continued to be developed. The third stage engine was replaced by an RD-110, giving better performance in the vacuum, and a variety of upper stage options were developed. Ultimately, the Molnia M design would launch almost 300 times, with the launch, last launch being in 2010. But back in the 1960s, the next step would be a Voskhod, which was similar to the Vostok spacecraft, but with enough extra hardware to make it heavier and necessitate a bigger launcher. The launch vehicle was essentially a Molnia, but with the upper stage removed. Voskhod 1 was the first multi-crew mission with three cosmonauts crammed inside the capsule, and Voskhod 2 allowed Alexei Leonov to perform the first spacewalk. November 1966 saw the maiden flight of the Soyuz rocket, carrying the first test version of the Soyuz spacecraft. The rocket was similar to the Voskhod with small iterations on the engines, but the payload was a huge step forward in terms of spacecraft design. Inevitably, Soyuz had many early problems. The first spacecraft spun out of control. The second had its launch escape system trigger on the pad due to an unforeseen interaction between its gyroscopes and the rotation of the Earth. And of course, the first crewed launch was a disaster, with multiple system failures ultimately culminating in a parachute failure that killed Vladimir Komarov in what was to be the first in-flight fatality in space travel. The engineers, of course, continued to iterate and solve problems on both the launch vehicle and the spacecraft. There were a number of small iterations made to the Soyuz rocket design, designated by appending a letter. Soyuz B, V and R were designed but never built. Soyuz L is notable for being the launch vehicle they used to carry the Soviet moon lander into orbit for testing, and Soyuz M was a short-lived military variant with which very little is known. However, Soyuz U, first launched in 1973, would go on to be the most launched rocket design. The booster engines were upgraded to RD-117s, which supplied about 5% more thrust, and the core engine became an RD-118 with about 20% more thrust. 
Soyuz U was used for more than 40 years in 765 launches, carrying Soyuz spacecraft, Progress cargo shuttles, and occasionally other satellites. Perhaps most notably, one of the first launches carried Soyuz 19 into orbit for a historic rendezvous in space with the last Apollo spacecraft. The final launch of a Soyuz U rocket carried a Progress Supply spacecraft to the ISS in February of 2017. There was also a Soyuz U-2 variant, which was essentially the same vehicle, but it replaced the kerosene fuel with Sintin. This was an expensive, synthetic, high-energy rocket fuel that improved performance, allowing 150 extra kilograms of payload. This was used from 1982 to 1995. Soyuz FG is the current iteration. It was first tested in 2001 and since 2002 it's been the rocket launching crewed Soyuz spacecraft. Engines were upgraded, electronics were modernized and all Soyuz launches to the ISS have used this design. But other payloads use the even newer Soyuz 2 series of launch vehicles. First launched in 2004, one of the major upgrades has been replacing the old analog guidance system with digital hardware, which now lets the rocket roll to the correct launch azimuth. Prior to this, the Soyuz launch pads had to rotate the rocket to the correct orientation. The engines and stages on the 2.1A are the same as the Soyuz FG and could deliver a 7-ton payload to low Earth orbit, but the 2.1B introduced a more efficient upper stage, raising the capacity to 8.2 tons. In 2011, these Soyuz 2 series rockets started launching commercial payloads from ESA's launch facility in Kourou. It's also worth mentioning the Fregat variants of the Soyuz, which replaces the Molnia. The Fregat is a series of hypergolic fueled upper stages using an engine originally designed for the ill-fated Phobos program. Payloads headed to geostationary orbit or interplanetary space use this design, and it's been around since about 2000. Finally, in what must be a moment of heresy in rocket design, we have the Soyuz 21V. This abomination gets rid of those four launch boosters and, by extension, the Korolev Cross. It replaces the main engine with the NK-33, the engine originally developed to power the ill-fated N-1 moon rocket. The NK-33 doesn't have any thrust vectoring, so they also have an RD-110R, which uh, basically puts four little small rocket nozzles around the main engine and uses that for uh, control. This small rocket's payload capacity is about 2.8 tons, and it's only launched three times so far, which some might think is too many, because as a great man once said, a Soyuz launch without a Korolev cross is scarcely a Soyuz at all. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.